Good afternoon. Five years ago, a dictator who had ruled my country for more than a decade, on almost my entire life, lost the election to a relatively unknown challenger. Yeah, Jambe has been accused of torturing and murdering political opponents, stifling and stealing from the country's treasury, but also for raping women. I am one of the women that Yaya Jambe raped, a man who ruled so strongly, a man who declared he could cure HIV and AIDS, the man I've always heard about, the only one on the screens of my TV. As a young person, sometime in 2014, I decided to participate in a scholarship pageant to take myself out of poverty and, of course, my family, watching what education has done for my mother, who was married off at an early age at 16, seeing how education has changed her life as she strived within a family of four other wives. She persevered, paved the way. In my world, my understanding of getting out of anything, of becoming a woman of my own, is to study. So when the dictator offered a scholarship to study anywhere in the world, I was excited. And I won. And I looked forward to a future full of possibilities, one with a higher education anywhere in the world. But instead, the dictator proposed to me at the age of 18. Naive as I was, I thought I could say no to a dictator. And I did say no. And a man so powerful that could not take no for an answer, so much of self coming from a nobody, he decided to inflict pain by drugging and raping me. I had to flee my country in disguise, wearing a niqab, getting into wooden boats with cars and a truck full of livestock, pedaling and finding my way into neighboring countries and then finding refuge in Canada. Try to rebuild my life, pretend like it never happened, just like a lot of other survivors of gendered violence. We try to move on, we first put onto ourselves everything that society and culture tries to impose on us. The shame and the guilt and the doubt. Asking ourselves, were we even really raped? So we get it. And our understanding of this is us mimicking the status quo because we do know that the establishment would rather see through us than look at us. We know this and we know better. So we become a political, invisible, find comfort in being spoken for. But in the end, who does the invisibility really benefit? Whose responsibility is it to break the cycle? Now, until we have that honest question, the Me Too conversation is lacking in huge proportions. We put ourselves in bubbles just like I did. I looked around, I became invisible in a big city like Toronto, a city I picked out from a map laid in front of me, a country I know nothing of, coming from a place where I, I do not discuss my body parts, coming from a country where there is no tangible word for rape. And when there isn't words, for rape, how do you express harm that has been done to it? So whilst the country galvanizes to take out a dictator, stories of sexual violence become headlines if we are going to talk about it. In 2019, after Jammeh was defeated out of power with the help of countries around the West African bloc who came together to actually force him into exile. I thought it was time to speak up because although I was safe, my family was not. A lot of young women were not. 
whilst we were busy discussing whether this dictator could actually cure HIV, AIDS, and cancer, we forgot about the young women and girls who were struggling to find the words for rape, struggling to express abuse that has been done to their bodies, told that their private parts are to be ashamed of. So we neglected it. And when I looked forward to a mentor, to a story that would inspire me, not to speak out, just to heal. I could not. I typed Gambia into a Google search box. Next to it, rape. Nothing pops up. There is no face behind the stories. We are just numbers. Statistics meant to check your boxes in your application forms. And I realize and jolted out of this idea of protecting the, my image of purity and sanctity because there's a picture bigger than myself, bigger than all of us, because the idea of protecting my image and sanctity was thought. I was told I had to. I was told it was my responsibility, thus having to protect the most powerful man who violated not only me, but many, many other women using the military and scholarships and other beautiful presented opportunities to women. When I could not find a face on Google search, I could not sit with the idea of being a one in five because we have all become dehumanized to the numbers. We see one in five, we're like, oh yeah, yeah, we all know those faceless stories, and when we happen to make it on the front pages, which is what happened when I spoke up in 2019, I was on the front page of the New York Times, the BBC, a lot of other media outlets around the world. And I realized I wasn't on the front pages because the world cared about me and who I was, but because the world cared about the name and the value and the man who ropes soldiers with presidents from democratic countries. If my president wasn't a rapist, my visibility would not stand. So I spoke out loudly. I spoke at the United Nations. I protested in the streets and also at the International Criminal Court. I launched the Tufa Foundation. I filmed documentaries and stay with the woman on the ground as much as I can just to be able to tell their stories, translating from local languages, brainstorming on how do we say rape for what it is, because in my language, when I want to tell you I've been raped, it sounds like robbing off my thigh, falling between my thighs, taking away the inhumane and grossness of the actual act of rape. So we hold on and hide behind those shields. And with the foundation and all the work I've done so far, joining a lot of Me Too conversations, the question is what now? Where are we when you put aside that newspaper, when you put aside that headline? What is happening to all of the women whose rapists are not presidents? I have learned one lesson, and that is when you're powerful enough if you're powerful enough, you can get away with grappling and groping. Donald Trump was right. Bill Clinton and other powerful people have made it back to the highest offices of democratic countries, despite allegations of sexual assault. In fact, in analysis of culture, business, and media, their assault become footnotes, or worse, proof of their potency and power. We are marching against, and we are talking against a culture that do not have, like my country, a single functioning women's shelter, not one. We do not have rape kits in our hospitals. The gap between a culture and a country that is talking about having rape kits not being tested on the other hand, across the Atlantic, you have a country that do not even have rape kits at all. Where we are in this day and age, wherein we can just order food at our fingertips, somehow these resources and these gaps 
are ever, ever getting bigger and bigger. As someone who will stand in front of graves of women that have been raped and murdered and no one is representing them. They are looking for language representation and victims are looking to speak for themselves instead of being spoken to. There is a possibility of an order too far, a young woman coming from a tiny village, coming from where I come from, being violated by the most powerful person and being able to stand here today and on any platform in the world and tell you, me too, and the most powerful person for more than two decades is a rapist and I am ready to hold him accountable. And we can only achieve that when we invest in human resources. We can only achieve that when we realize the stories are not only the ones that make it to the front page. It's the Mariamas and the Sainabus and the Bintas and the Fatimas and the Sajos and the Sainabus of our world. So I urge you, to join us, to amplify the voices that do not make it to your favorite places and your favorite pages, to spread our word online, to so come with us, especially with the foundation, to help advocates be able to do their work whilst keeping safe and keeping sane. Because trust me, we sometimes do lose ourselves in the work. We urge social media companies to protect advocates online. But most exciting tonight is I am ready to tell you that we do have a plot of land, a big space that is empty but full of dreams. Because I believe it's almost irresponsible to ask young women and girls to say me too, speak out against powerful people who have people rallying behind them. They have the media to skew to their narrative but not have a home to take these young people to, not have a space to protect them in. So I hope you join the Tufa Foundation in making this dream a reality. So when I stand in front of young people, when I mentor young women, when I rally with them, when I walk in the streets demanding that they seek justice, asking for their basic human rights to be respected, demanding to be part of the transitional justice process of that country. There is some way to hold them safe. There is someone to, some way to help them heal and become advocates for themselves. I hope you leave here today and I hope I get off this stage and that we connect and I talk to you about all these people I'm so passionate about and wish I can talk to you about them all night. But their stories are real. Your realization of their stories matter, and I hope you join the fight. Thank you.